Welcome to the CHCI Spring Policy Summit Panel, the role of the Latino workforce in the recovery. We would like to thank our generous friends at the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union, Accenture, and DoorDash for making this session possible. Our moderator for today's session is Titiki Felix, host and news anchor, Univision Washington Newscasts. She is a multiple award-winning journalist and international speaker. She is currently the host of Politica Ya, a national politics show in Washington, D.C., and the news anchor for Univision Washington Newscasts. Please welcome our moderator, Titiki Felix. Hello, everyone. My name is Titiki Felix. It's almost the same pronunciation but I've been called many names, Titiki, Mitsubishi, Kawasaki. Titiki is fine. It sounds very similar. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. And it's an honor as usual to be part of this great challenging times to talk about what we can do to make sure that we continue to thrive as a Latino community. And of course, CHCI's mission is to always make sure that we all contribute to make sure that we put a little bit of grain of salt in this workforce during the recovery in the Latino community that has been impacted throughout the pandemic. Now, I would like to share with you some information that makes it so important for us to discuss uh, this situation and try to come up with answers to try to be proactive and make sure that we are participating. The United States lost 22 million jobs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 22 million jobs we're talking about. It affects the Latino workforce and has been devastating results. In its peak in April 2020, Latino unemployed near 20% with Latinas facing disproportionate job loss and reduced incomes. As well as the nation begins to emerge from the lockdown with opportunities in manufacturing and the service industry in particular back on the job market, we're starting to see a little bit first sight of economic relief. And I'm sure you've all seen this very slowly. I'd like uh, for every single one person to join us today and to come up with answers as well as questions or maybe ideas to discuss and reflect upon in regards to what the situation we are seeing today. Uh, we have experts in the industry and usually these conversations are not necessarily just Q and A. It's more of a conversation and we want to keep it flowing. Um, the, the experts and the panel of the experts that we have have different points of view. And it doesn't matter we in a moment we start debating as to how to recover and how to make sure that the Latino community starts to get up and to make sure that it's uh, thriving after the pandemic. I'd like to welcome the three panelists today and we're going to be giving them each one 90 seconds to introduce themselves to talk about what they do and why they're here with us today at this panel. We have Ademola Oyefeso, he's International Vice President and Director of Legislative and Political Action Department, United Hur and Commercial Workers International Union. Mr. Oyefeso, bienvenido, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Felix. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Oyefeso. I'm the International Vice President at the United Food and Commercial Workers Union and the Director of Legislative and Political Action for the Union. I'm also a proud board member of the CHCI. The UFCW is a union of 1.3 million members in North America. Members represent industries such as food retail, meat processing, healthcare, chemical workers, and distillery workers, and many others. Our membership is 50% people of color, with almost half of that being Latino, and a majority of our overall membership are women. These members are the, are the ones that were crucial to your everyday life, but that fact only came to life to most people la over the last year when their essential work became more visible. Workers in our meat packing plants and our grocery stores contracted COVID rates at higher percentages. And tens of thousands of our members contracted COVID. Hundreds more died from it. And their role during this pandemic and during its recovery has been one that has been noticed ignored and taken for granted. These members work in meat packing plants where last year many of you heard about workers dying, getting sick in these plants, which resulted in people not having um, people running on making runs to the grocery stores for meat, for hamburgers, steak, and etc. But these members stayed working, masked up, and protected themselves and their families so that America could keep eating. When you went to the grocery store and saw people yelling at these workers, these were the same people who with courteous, were courteous and respectful to people to make sure that they brought, that you were able to bring food home. 
So the role of Latinos, of our Latino membership as part of the workforce and the recovery has been one of constant steady work that has protected and fed America. Our, our members in healthcare have protected people in hospitals and nursing homes. These are the members, even when you needed a drink, you were most likely drinking a union made liquor made by our members. So during every part of the recovery and the pandemic, our members have been there for you. And our hope is that as a country, we're there for them, whether and especially to our Latino members who were disproportionately affected during the pandemic and meatpacking plants. But so, thank, thank you, Ms. Felix. Okay. You've made a huge point, and I thank you. Uh, you've actually stated how important it is, the role of the Latinos in the workforce towards recovery, and that is the point. The essential workers, which are immigrant most of the time, are the ones being affected. Thank you. We have also Tony Anaya, Global Head of Government Relations, DoorDash. Tony, welcome to CHCI's session today. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for all of the participants and my, my fellow panelists. It really is a pleasure here to, to be here today talking about what is a very important, I think, topic, um, and one that we take very seriously at DoorDash. Um, in my capacity at DoorDash, I have the privilege of leading our government relations efforts and um, have really been on the front lines of seeing how the global pandemic has impacted um, the, the three sides of our, our, our marketplace. Um, the dashing partners, those folks who are involved, the essential workers who actually make the deliveries um, from the restaurants, our merchant partners who have been really hard, hit hard, particularly, I would say, um, Latino rest, Latino owned restaurants um, in, in, in some of our bigger cities um, were really impacted tremendously. Um, and, you know, really looking at those two lessons, you know, coming from our perspective, what was happening with the restaurants and how could we use our platform to help the restaurants survive the pandemic, um, and in some instances, um, you know, even grow uh, moving forward. And then I really think the most important piece here is is the critical need that we saw for supplemental income in the country uh, that really came to rise during the pandemic. Um, and that need um, and that demand for flexible earnings opportunities can't be overstated. Um, and uh, if, if you look at the numbers, you know, between March and September of last year, we saw um, 1.9 million new individuals join our platform to uh, make deliveries, and they earned approximately $3.5 billion. So, um, you know, that with, with approximately 60% of that being dashers who, who live in zip codes with above average Black and Latino representation. So we, we understand a huge impact that the employment component plays and the, and the, and the access to, to earnings opportunities. That said, moving forward, we really need to figure out the future of work. What is our relationship with the dashers moving forward? We really want to find a model that that allows these hardworking individuals access to flexible earnings opportunities, but also offering some kind of benefits that they can take um, as they continue their work. So I'm looking forward to that part of the conversation as well. But uh, it's an important topic, and we're, we're we're thrilled to be here. Excellent, Tony. And, and catching up on what you just mentioned, let's make sure that everybody that is joining us today, a lot of people, I'm, I'm very sure, have companies, they have uh, friends, they have uh, family members who are in delivery as well. So they can come up with ideas and questions that maybe have a challenging conversation as to come as to how to come up with a solution as to what we're going through right now. Thank you, Tony. Our next panelist is Elliot Segarra, Managing Director, Strategy and Consulting Practice of Accenture. Elliot, bienvenido a CHCI session. Muchas gracias and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what an honor and privilege it is to be part of this of this panel and uh, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm Elliot Segarra and I'm, I'm part of uh, Accenture Strategy and Consulting Practice uh, based out of Chicago. I also have the honor and privilege of serving as our Hispanic American ERG uh, co-lead, uh, where we have over 4,000 members and over 30 chapters represented in North America. You know, as 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 Ms. Felix, you and the co-panelists have mentioned, uh, you know, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the Latino workforce. It, it, this is important for me, and it's it's crucial as, as we're starting to emerge from the pandemic. Pandemic. And as employers are working to rebuild their workforces, it's critical to ensure that all communities, including the Latino community, are equitably, equitably represented in, in the hiring pipelines. Um, and so how, how do we leverage uh, technology and how do we reskill 
uh, our, our communities. So, you know, to, to take advantage of the opportunities uh, uh, that are coming, you know, post pandemic. Um, and so hopefully during the discussion and dialogue today, we'll be able to unpack, you know, how, how the public and private sector are coming together uh, to, to help make that happen. Elliot Segarra, thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get ready for our uh, Q&A with our panelists, the conversation, and make sure that everybody, everyone, every one of you that are watching today, start writing some questions. We're gonna be going back to you and making sure that we have uh, a robust conversation as to how to move forward with this situation that hopefully this pandemic stays behind us. Let's keep crossing our fingers. Now, as um, Oyefeso was mentioning to us, and uh, would you like me, Adamola, to call you by your last name or your first name? My first name is fine. Ademola, do I say it right? Perfectly. Perfect. I, I like what you what you mentioned to me uh, on the beginning. You mentioned what the root of the problem is, Ademola, and you said you you said it very clearly. The most vulnerable community is the one being impacted the most. Why? Lack of resources, lack of attention, maybe lack of, of tools to protect themselves. What do you foresee the main problem is for these challenges to continue with our community and being impacted throughout the pandemic? Well, <clears throat> the the first thing was, you know, access to childcare was a big issue for a lot of our members. When the world shut down, a lot of, you know, schools went full remote. You ended up with our members who had kids who didn't have laptops, iPads or whatever at home. So remote schooling wasn't an option. And then you had people who had to get to work during the pandemic. So when transportation hubs, I know um, in New York, the 24 hour subway system went to limited hours. It was no longer 24. So you had members who had to get to grocery stores that started shifts while the subway was still closed. So they had to make new um, ways to get around. You had members who had to, you know, I myself am fortunate when I had to go to work, my mother and my mother lives down the block from me so she could watch the kids. But a lot of my members aren't as lucky. So you had that issue. And then just the levels of pay for people. So a lot of the essential workers, as a lot of um, businesses have called them, the media calls them essential workers, never received essential pay. So they ended up in a position where to pay for childcare wasn't an option, but they had to go to work. I was on a call where an elected said the biggest fear they had was that these essential workers wouldn't show up. We saw the run on toilet paper at grocery stores. Imagine if a meatpacking workers actually didn't show up to work or the grocery store didn't open. So the, the first thing to make sure these communities are better prepared in the future for a pandemic or just for tomorrow is to work on a way to make sure people can afford childcare, people can be paid well, people can have job security and benefits so that when life happens or when a pandemic happens, they're secure and they're able to go ahead like the rest of us who could, you know, work via Zoom. And this brings us to the next question, Ademola, and this question will go to you, Tony. Um, I also want to make sure that Elliot, Ademoya, and, and, and you, Tony, uh, if you want to pitch in, you feel free to do so, okay? And let's try to answer the, the questions as compact as possible so that we can continue, maybe have more time for the Q&A with, with our audience. Now, there are a couple of information in, uh, facts that I find very interesting, Tony. As Ademola was mentioning, there is a disparity of help when it comes to needs in the US and more so now with the pandemic, it's been exacerbated. Just as an example, manufacturing job loss was at 6.4%. Accommodation and food services dropped 31.8%. Insurance and finance dropped only two, I'm sorry, 0.2%. It's minimal. Still, um, there wasn't really any difference as to what services or help was distributed by the government. What is your opinion on this fact? And what would you suggest could be done in terms of this kind of uh, disparities for help? I, I think that's a, a, a fantastic question. And, and certainly from our perspective, we, we had a unique venue into 
um, what was taking place with the restaurants, what was taking place with the essential workers, um, and frankly, what was going on with um, the, the need in general in the community in terms of food insecurity. Um, and if I can answer that question, maybe looking at three components. Um, one, the government um, acted very slowly. I think uh, we don't need to get into that debate. But um, one area where they they did respond, and, and particularly recently, was through the Restaurant Revitalization Act. And that was funding um, to go to restaurants to help them you know, recover as a significant allocation, but probably not enough. And we're hoping that the federal government will continue to, to look to ways to support the small um, and medium-sized restaurants, particularly those in the communities that essentially act as the as the backbone for 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 local communities. If your restaurants aren't healthy, um, then then your community isn't healthy. Um, we also saw a lot of food insecurity issues percolate, and with people being um, isolated to their homes, this this played out in a very um, um, you know kind of a tragic way, but a way in which at DoorDash we were able to to help meet some of the needs. We've been partnering with food banks um, in particular and other governmental entities to facilitate deliveries from food banks to individuals who are either homebound because of COVID or, or, or were ill. So um, being able to work with our independent contractors and with the Dashers to facilitate that last mile delivery um, really, in, in my mind, showed how, how, how significant hunger and, and food insecurity is. We're currently working with uh, several members of Congress to try to expand access to um, delivery in the in the sense of um, of hunger and food insecurity, and then I think that the the final area, and this is a longer policy debate, but um, as, as we looked at essential workers and we looked at this huge critical need for supplemental income, the fact that our platform in particular is easy to access, there's low barriers to entry. Um, if you have two or three free hours and you want to make deliveries, you can hop on the platform, uh, perform those deliveries, um, and um, and in in essentially have the, the money in your bank account that evening or the next day, that really became a lifeline for a lot of people who were either impacted directly through job loss or um, were needing to supplement income. But, um, you know, the old model of independent contractors and uh, employee, traditional employee isn't going to work in the future. And I think we're excited and hoping that the government takes a very uh, strong look at how we um, get to the future of work. What, what is that right mix where we've got the ability for essential workers to have the flexibility that, that, that the majority of them want, um, while also having things like um, portable benefits, access to some kind of health care, some kind of safety parameters. So we're really encouraged that maybe we can really drive that conversation heading out of the pandemic. And the fact that you brought that up also was mentioned by Ademola. Go ahead, Ademola, where you wanted to mention something oh, else. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, I think uh, one of the big points that was brought up through the pandemic was the misclassification of workers around the independent contractor uh, model. Because uh, while some people are true independent contractors, what we saw last year was a lot of people who it's, you know, it's less so supplemental. It's more so these different gig jobs are their jobs and they're working multiple. When the pandemic hit, they didn't have access to unemployment. So then the administration, then last year, Congress, you know, and we thank them for doing this for our, you know, for all of our members, our not members, but just the community, created the pandemic unemployment plan. So all of these workers who had never, their employers or they never paid into the unemployment system were out of work and didn't know what to do. So what we learned from it was that these are people who have no control over their schedules, no control over their job, or working for a company, but are misclassified as independent contractors. So one thing that we need to do to fix this so that in the future it doesn't happen again is fix worker misclassification. Because when you don't control what you charge, how you know what your delivery time is, who you deliver to, you're an employee. And so we need to make, and you deserve all the same protections of, you know, albeit we saw long lines of people filing unemployment, but they were able to get it. They didn't have to wait for an act of Congress to get it. So if you're an employee, you should be able to access those benefits and not be subjected to waiting for Congress to pass a law that makes you get it for a finite period of time. Excellent point. If, if, I, like that. Go ahead, Jenny. if I may, and, and I think um, uh, we're probably 95% in agreement in, in, in the sense that the, the current model is, is broken. It, it's not what we're going to need moving forward. The traditional employee model, the traditional independent contractor model um, is something that we need to fix. 
Um, I think it's important though, when you look at the, at the essential workers and independent contractors, um, there's a universe of people doing different types of, 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 of work. And, you know, at least in terms of DoorDash's uh, relationship with our dashers, um, 91% of the dashers who are on the platform are on there for 10 hours per week, on average, four hours a week. Um, four out of five say it's not their main source of income. These are students. These are moms, dads, folks looking to supplement their income. Now, that's well, being the vast majority. Well, my dad is a delivery now, driver, and he works about 40 hours per week. So yes. they, they, he does get exactly. all his income by driving, and that's pretty much his only source. I'm sure there's and a I lot think of people. Those are, the, I mean, those are the drivers and those are the delivery people, particularly those who work across multiple platforms who are turning to this type of work for full time. We need to solve for that. And that is, I think, where we need to need to figure figure out how we can maintain that, that flexibility, but also bring the benefits. So, you know, while the, yeah. while the vast majority are just on there periodically, there is a important large group of people who are turning to this for for all of their income. And that needs to be fixed. Yes, it is definitely increasing. And also there is another point that Demola mentioned, Tony, and that maybe you, Elliot, can pitch in. Are any of you gentlemen married with kids? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. And do your wives work? Yes. Uh, my wife yes. does not work. She's not working right now. Okay. Well, I'm not yeah. married, no kids. So that's the reason we're touching this to make sure that we understand the impact. And if I was married, and I had kids and the whole job comes on my shoulders and I have to be the one that leaves work, not, not only would it impact me as a woman and as a partner, but also my husband. Why? Because the whole responsibility falls on his shoulder. So I'll share with you a couple of uh, points that were very impactful in my eyes in terms of um, the labor force for mothers leaving it. So. During the COVID, it estimates that the risk of them leaving to assume the caretaking responsibility, listen to this, 64.5 billion per year in lost wages and economic activity. So as we think about different solutions to fix not only the, 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 the problems that we're facing with uh, contractors and as well as people that have maybe an employment, an easier way, there's a lot of women that are impacted by this, Elliot. What do you think could be done to help our working mothers who are the ones impacted. And I'm not even mentioning the single mothers who are increasingly uh, impacted during this pandemic, mostly in the Latino community. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great, a great question. I, I think employers have a big role in providing the support. Uh, working mothers need to be part of it. Right. And, and so, and given, and so then how do you how do you adequately care for the children? So given that 2020 was challenging for everyone, especially working parents, right? Uh, homeschooling and, and, and being remote, um, we did our best to support our people um, in their life journey, you know, with corporate benefits and then COVID specific benefits, right? So as an example, um, we offer subsidized backup dependent care to support children, adult and elder care needs. Right. We offered this before the pandemic, but to help our people meet our new demands um, brought by the pandemic, we, we made sure that everyone in North America was eligible to receive additional hours of back of child care. Uh, we also created flexibility with the benefit to allow our employees to choose between at home service or financial reimbursement for parents to use with a caregiver of their choice. Right. Um, overall, uh, employers. Like Accenture, we have an opportunity to make significant investments in building a more flexible and empathetic workplace. Uh, the effort or lack of effort will, will have consequences on gender equality and the wider economy for years to come. Now, there's a lot of things that should be done that maybe are not being done to resolve the pandemic and the impact on the Latino workforce during this pandemic. Now, what has been done? In your opinion, Ademola, is there something that we're doing right at this moment that if we continue doing so, might be helping us? Yes, there's a big thing. Uh, in the uh, President Biden and the in Congress in the American Rescue Plan passed the child care tax credit. So, and I know it because we've been pushing it to our members. In July 15th, if you've already sat, filed your tax return, you p families will start getting $250 every month for every child six and over, and if your kid, if your child is under six, it's three hundred dollars a month towards childcare expenses. Now, I remember 
for for my well, I know for my members, that's a big deal. Three hundred dollars every month. This is it's a limited time, but that helps towards childcare. You know, during the pandemic, what was done, there was money allocated for people to pay for childcare, but you had to go through a maze to get it. And mm -hmm. while it was meant to be helpful, it was hard to get to. But right now in the rescue plan, this program that they have there will be beneficial because, you know, a member at home, family, you get 250 you use it towards child expenses, and you move on, and you don't have to think about it. And our goal, we're working with the administration to try and make sure it's in the, it's in the American Families Plan, and we're going to make sure to pass it because this is really impactful to all working Mothers, fathers, families, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever it is, because that's how you how, – how do you go back to work? $64 billion lost in wages because you can't work? When you have child care, you can go back to work. And now the industry is going towards a lot – it's changing, gentlemen. The industry is changing. Uh, and we're talking about more delivery for food. People are cooking less, right? Everything's digital. Right now we're having this session uh, virtually via computer uh so things are changing constantly and one of the changes that i noticed tony is that a lot of people are getting jobs in your industry and, and talking about you know just even part-timers people right here uh, colleagues of mine that are reporters that are uh editors or or, or cameramen they're thinking okay maybe i can do this on the side how do we make sure that we thrive on the opportunities and to also help those that only depend on that kind of workforce to make sure that not only do we more work, do, do we move forward to a great technology era, but also we take care of those that are more vulnerable. I, I, I think you have absolutely um, framed the question perfectly. And that is, um, it, it, as we see it, is how can we preserve this platform that a lot of people turn to for um, supplemental income? Um, 90% of the people who are doing this type of work are, are doing it to to um, supplement existing wages or doing it, you know, a lot of students are on the platform. Um, and uh, particularly right now, given the, the demand, um, on average, uh, if you're on the platform in the U.S., you're making $25 per active hour. Um, if you're in some of the bigger cities, that could be $30, $35 per active hour. So um, it's, mm -hmm. it's not um, an insignificant amount of money. But um, getting to your the, the core of your question, and that is for those folks who are on this platform, who are turning to it um, more full time. And we do know anecdotally, I mean, there are a lot of people who are, you know, recent immigrants, um, you know, legally, we cannot be um, um, bringing people to the platform unless they have a social security number. But um, we suspect there's 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 a lot going on in that area that that um, that we need to um, you know, be supportive of and solve for. But there's a lot of people who are turning to that platform, staying on it very heavily, and are maybe doing you know, 30, 40, maybe more, more hours a week. They're, they're driving for Lyft um, and Uber and then dashing for DoorDash. Or, uh, so that universe of people, we need to figure it out. And I, and, and I re really think the best approach, and we're experimenting with some of this in, in some states, and we've got some exciting things that I think have been in the news in New York State in particular as of late, and that is, you know, how can we partner with it, whether it's a labor union or whether it's um, with the government to come up with that mechanism? So if you're on the platform for 40 hours, there is, you know, my company's paying into a benefits fund. Um, and if you want to move to another platform, you, you can take that benefit with you. What can we do to provide some type of, of health care coverage? Um, what can we do, um, you know, to provide some kind of, um, you know, protections against uh, sexual harassment or violence. You know, safety is an in increasingly important issue. So the pieces are there. We just need to all get to the table and, and put on our thinking caps and, and solve for that. That's very interesting, Tony. Do you see any changes coming up? Because what you just mentioned right now will be ideal. And I think it will be the fair thing to do. I think if you, there's a couple of states where we're having active conversations and I can't really tip my hat too much, but I think we're gonna be seeing some developments very soon. Um, I think there's a desire to have the conversation at the federal level as well. Um, and from DoorDash's perspective, you know, we're excited to, you know, Secretary Walsh talked about the gig economy in the past couple of weeks. We're very excited to see um, where that might lead if there is the potential to have a conversation with the Biden administration around this issue. Um, um, you know, my, my friend at, at UFCW, I, I think we often find ourselves, unfortunately, on the opposite side of this issue, but it's going to be solved when we come together and meet in the middle. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that um, I know from my company's perspective, we're committed to the future of work. And I think the time is now. 
Absolutely. And I think we all have one, one thing in common. We want a fair thing for everyone. And of course, we also want the new companies to thrive because without the new companies thriving, there is no employment. So there's always important to see both sides of the coin. We cannot just, you know, close our minds and say, this is the right thing. No, no. We have to just be open to new ideas. Now, Elliot, your point, your point, uh, you're in a strategy. And, and of course, you've been someone that is uh, directing different uh, consulting practices and a strategy when it comes to your job. What do you think are the main points that we can start working on that can be effective uh, going towards a recovery for the pandemic in the Latino community? That we all can yeah, do. I, that we I, all can. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's important that uh, we ensure that we're tapping the best and diverse talent uh, as we look at the skills of the future, right? So what we what we want to make sure we do is create pathways and, and develop pipelines for us to tap into that talent. Um, it, it's you know I, I think to to Tony's point right there's there, there's there's a change you know we've proven uh, with the pandemic that we can work we can work remotely be effective remotely. Um, now does that require you know where those skills are? Um, you know I think we need to open up and, and think outside the box on how we're tapping that skill set, especially Latino skill set. And, and one, of the, one of the pipelines for us is our apprenticeship program. Um, and so our apprenticeship program is about opening up those opportunities for people from all kinds of background, whether they have a college degree or not. Um, and and it's, it's a way, you know, as we learn technology can have the power to, to unify or, or divide, and there's so many Americans at risk uh, of being left behind. And so um, it's our res responsibility to reskill our workers where, where jobs have been or will be disrupted by technology. So, it, it, you know, in, in a nutshell, it's, it's, you know, we're recognizing that to find the best people, we need to change the way we look at things. And when you do that, it creates new opportunities. opportunities. So um, when, you, when you focus on is, uh, the essential skills that a job requires, um, you know, we've been able to remove degree requirements from some roles in the U.S., and that allows us to provide different opportunities for people who don't have those traditional backgrounds, right? Um, about 60% of our apprentices are from racially and, and ethnically diverse backgrounds, and one out of four apprentices are military veterans, and, and, and they're thriving and succeeding in a career at Accenture where traditional channels, they wouldn't even, you know, been on the radar. And so um, we are very proud of, of the apprentice program that started right here in Chicago and it spanned across, across the country. We're partnering with different, different companies to create these opportunities uh, for individuals that are, are well capable and skilled. And we're just creating that, that pipeline of opportunity. And, and things are changing constantly. Definitely something that we're going to be looking forward to uh, working remotely, or how do we get those skills to make sure that Latinos get compensated in a fair manner as well? Ademola, uh, being a, a, an important part of the union workforce, they they want to make sure that they receive the fair wages, the tools, um, and the economic compensation. However, there is a lot of businesses right now going broke because of the pandemic. Many of them are not even getting the help from the government as it was supposed to. Now, unions have been blamed in many cases as well because they push the business to the brink of failure when it comes to pushing for a lot, minimum wages, $15 per hour, per instance, which has been on the table for many years. And, but a lot of businesses are making a lot of money and they continue to pay the, the employees a very little amount in comparison to what they're doing. What do you think will be a middle ground to make sure that our community gets a fair treatment and also the owners of the businesses continue to thrive? So uh, for a middle ground, I think it's the middle ground is when I always look at this from a labor standpoint. I represent private, like we, we're a private sector union. All of our employers, if they fail, our members lose a job. So it's a falsehood when people say, oh, the union's what made me close. Because it's never in the benefit of the union for an employer to close, because then our members lose their jobs. 
So that's the falsehood. Most likely when a business closed, it's because the CEO who was paid millions of dollars made a strategic mistake and he needs a fall guy. And it turns out to be his 100,000 workers, 5,000 workers, whatever have you. But the middle ground comes into, it's, it's simple. If your CEO is making $20 million and your whole C-suite makes 60, whatever, $60 million a year, but your, work, your average hourly workers are making minimum wage, the middle ground is when you lift them out of poverty by taking your $20 million and make it $5 million. Because 5 and $20 million, there's no difference in how your quality of life is. But seven fifty to $15, there's a big quality of life difference. So it's the, the middle ground is when the people who have a lot realize that the people that they called essential workers, you know, the people who made sure you had burgers, the people who made sure you had when you bought, you know, 30 rolls of toilet paper who were there to check you out can work and go to school and make sure their kids go to school. When you realize that they need to be paid fairly so that their kid can have a laptop just like yours does and when schools go remote, that's the middle ground. Because it's mm -hmm. not this dichotomy, it's not this issue that unions want to take everything or want to shut down a company. It's never the case because no, we, we're hurting right. ourselves if we do that. I want to make sure that you, uh, gentlemen, Tony, Elliot, feel free to pitch in. But I want to get your thoughts on this, Ademola. Recently, there was a strike. Um, I think it was in Massachusetts, and correct me, guys, if I'm wrong, but a strike by uh, nurses because they were getting 40 plus um, sick people per person, okay? And they're exhausted. They're tired. They can't take it anymore. However, the hospital cannot do anything. They're trying to figure out how to deal with the pandemic. So it's one domino effect that is impacting not just the nurses, the hospital, and people that don't want to get sick because they don't want to fall into the hands of a hospital where the nurses are striking. What can be done in those situations? And we're, we're talking about essential workers that are being heroes to try to save lives. They're not getting the right resources from the hospital. The hospital cannot do much more either because they need the nurses to complete their jobs. And the people that are getting sick, well, they're, ca they're caught in the middle. It's a, it's a, I see it as a very complicated situation. So I don't know about that specific issue, but I know that nurses are usually fighting for safe staffing ratios. And, you know, full disclosure, my mother-in-law is a nurse and she's a great one. Um, but it's when nurses talk about staffing ratios, it's because if you've ever been in a hospital for any reason, you, re you know that you see your nurse and talk to them more often. Um, I've, sp I've, you know, for, I've been in a hospital where the nurse is the person I talk to who walks me through it. And so they're asking for a level where they can keep giving quality care. If a nurse has 40 patients, that means I'm seeing them one, you know, maybe for two seconds. And that's not helpful because I'm seeing the doctor probably for one second. So I think it's a long-term fight that became exposed during the pandemic. But I think we, you know, it's sort of like planning for what you pay people and how much you work people. If you want good medical care, I think if you want good food care, food service, whatever it is, you have to worry about your only driver can't be profit. It also has to be the health of your workforce and the health of your customers, because these are the people who make your business profitable. All of these people. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll add, I can't, I can't speak to, if I may add, uh, yes. I, I can't speak to the specific nurse situation, but but I can I can speak to you know, what, what's happening at Accenture, right? So, you know, you, we've, we moved 97% of our workforce uh, at the start of pandemic within 10 days remote. Um, and as we all know, we've all experienced, you know, being remote, um, always being on, there's, there's, you know, folks are tired, there's, there's screen fatigue, there's burnout. And, and, you know, what we've been able to do is, is create space because, you know, we value inclusion and diversity at Accenture that, we provide the space for folks to, 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 to check in on, on each other, make sure that, that our folks are, 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 are being taken care of and just, just listen to what's going on, right? To the points of, you know, now they're, you know, they're managing 
elderly care, child care, while they're trying to manage their career. Um, there's a lot going on and, and it's just not business as usual. And so, you know, what we've done is, is create the space, um, uh, capabilities around, you know, providing services like meditation apps, creating the space for folks to just step back and just, um, you know, take time for themselves so that they can uh, recharge. And, and, you know, as we're starting to come out of this pandemic, what we're starting to realize is, you know, we're going to need our people more than ever. And so it's important that we create that space for them to, to reflect, recharge, and, and, and be able to come out stronger at the end of this pandemic. There is a comment from Ines Gonzalez I'd like to share it with you. She says, Latinas have seen the most job losses during COVID-19 because of the sectors where they usually work, which is tourism, retail, and education. She's right. Now, I'm going to ask a few questions. We're going to move down. We're going to move now to the Q&A session. People are sending us questions, and they're very interesting. And I, like, I want to welcome any one of you to answer if you find a question that you want to answer. Um, can all the panelists talk more about the impact of AI and technology on the future of work, which I think you were mentioning that right now, Elliot? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit on it. I think it's in, I think it's, uh, you know, the future work around thinking about, you know, what are those opportunities uh, that can be, you know, so when you look at a business process, right, there's ways to simplify, um, you know, standardize and automate. And, you know, a, what we're starting to see is in this remote world, AI is become, becoming, you know, artificial intelligence and the use of, of technology um, to onboard new employees. We, we're, seeing, we're seeing case studies in, in recruiting. How do you shorten the cycle of recruiting um, to, to onboard an individual from all the way from, from sourcing to, to, to hire? Um, and so, you know, automation, there's, there's a human element to the automation piece, right? So there's, there's this myth that, you know, machine is replacing, replacing the people. But I, I, when you look at AI, AI learns. And so it's going to create uh, a, a pool of, of opportunities for more values, uh, I would say value skills, where the routine mundane will be automated. And so the individuals will have the opportunity to focus on more value added activities versus the more routine mundane activities of the day, right? So um, are we, and that's why it's important for us when we talk about the future of work and reskilling is we're starting to see, hey, we, you know, let's keep it simple. We, we have bots, right? We need people to teach the bots, right? And we need people to continue to teach the bots and use the information that the bots are, are, are sharing to make more value at more value added decisions in the, in, in the business, right? So it's becoming more strategic and more value add um, when you look at the combination of human and machine. If I can build on that a little bit, I, I think what's important to recognize is that um, AI is coming and what we're, we're not as fast at and where we need to get better and all of us need to be more proactive is in um, creating a policy universe that is going to make this um, coming wave um, more humane, um, more um, fair and more equitable. And I think, you know, it's, it's easy to think about, you know, jobs being replaced by, by robots and even in the delivery category, you know, what does the future of delivery look like? You know, we're certainly looking at every, every, um, every facet, um, you know, and, and these progress in this, in the technology is good, but we have to be thinking ahead and we have to be thinking what kind of impact is this going to have on the workforce? Um, and, and it's particularly important for us to think about this through the lens of, of the Latino community, of communities of color, of, of, of low income communities, those that, that traditionally depend on the manual labor type jobs. Um, what can we be doing? So I, I do think, you know, every one of us has that obligation to be thinking about this and, and offering proactive solutions. Um, I think some of it has to do with, um, you know, certainly in, from our perspective is, is really thinking forward about what the future of work looks like. And I know it's it's. It can be a little bit of a phrase, but there are ornaments that we can start to hang on this tree and um, re really get smart about it in advance. Ademola? Yes, um, so I think the question there too, there's the AI where it's technology actually taking over the jobs, but then there's the future of work and what it's being 
what that's doing, which is more of a reversal ba uh, back to the past on work, because you have uh, we have members who deliver food, groceries for people who make twenty, twenty five dollars an hour to deliver groceries. These are good jobs. They have a pension. They have health care. These are good jobs. So now you don't want to end up in a future where AI, the point of AI is to spread that one job to four people who don't make that same amount, don't have those benefits. Because it's not, yes, the technology is making it easier for um, you to order the food, but it's still the same process at the end of delivering the food. So that's, the, that's where we have to worry about the future of work, because AI could be in how you put the food together or how you decide how it's delivered. But we, what you always have to be careful of is, is AI actually making things easier or is it dispersing the pay from workers to the owners or to the shareholders? Because if that's all you're doing, that's not a technological advancement. That's just what they did in 1920s. That's a technological reversal. That's a societal reversal. So you have to be careful. So AI is coming and we have to be ready for it, but we also can't be caught in a trap where AI brings us back to the past. And we have a comment uh, from the chat and she says that we need to create a pathway to jobs that offer benefits. So that's going to your comment, uh, Ademola. Um, there is a survey as well, gentlemen, that says that one third of the Latino respondents that created part of this survey said that, that they experienced discrimination in the workplace. That's a pretty high number, one third. Uh, and the fact that they say that there's uh, discrimination, that's, it's worrisome. What do you think can be done to step away from this and create more opportunities and more inclusive opportunities? And this is for you, Tony. What do you think, what your thoughts are? Well, I, I look at this from two perspectives. One is from the, you know, the, the full-time employees at DoorDash. Uh, we have approximately 5,000 full-time employees. And then looking across the, the network of, um, of, of Dashers and our independent contractors and even our merchant partners, um, I think certainly the past couple of years, last year in particular, has caused us at DoorDash to really look at these issues carefully um, to um, update how we talk about it internally um, whether it's the creation of employee um, resource groups, um, but really, you know, what are our external commitments to um, to issues dealing with 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 discrimination? So I think there's that that real hard gut check that ha needs to happen internally that a lot of companies are going to that I know that we're going through now, um, and and we need to be cognizant of that that our workforce um, develop you know reflects the the uh, the community as a as a Latino male. I, I know I'm I'm one of 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 not many at, at my company at my level and um, we need to see more of us. And I think that's that's a plan that we have in place and something we're gonna need to be doing. Um, the, in terms of the, the the Dasher community, I think there's a, a an obligation that we have in, in, in partnering with them in hearing about their concerns. We have formed um, what we call Dasher councils that, um, that they're, they're, um, they're growing throughout the US, but it's essentially interested Dashers who, who want to get together and, and bring up issues and share that information um, and in a way that maybe we can address, whether it's an issue with how they're treated by the merchants, access to restrooms, just various issues that are important. And this issue of, of discrimination has surfaced. Now, I don't know what the answers are um, at this point, but I do think that we need to be talking about it more and more. Um, it's, it's, it's a very serious issue. And, and I think, um, um, you know, we're 100 percent committed to trying to solve for it, but uh, it, it is definitely a systemic systemic challenge. This, the, the, the good fact is that we're having these conversations pre precisely for that because this can be conducive to finding ways from different fronts, from uh, Ademola's point of view, from Elliot's point of view, your point of view, Tony, to try to come up with a way that not just impacts in a beneficial way, but also helps the communities thrive as well as the employees. Elliot, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, I'll just add, uh, you know, at Accenture, we have a zero tolerance for, for discrimination and, you know, with our ERGs and, uh, you know, especially our Hispanic American ERG, uh, we create a, a, a platform uh, for, uh, for our folks to have a sense of community, but also we also uh, inform our senior leadership about the issues and, and, and the concerns of our, of our Hispanic community. And so, um, you know, we through through the ERG network and through our and, and our senior leaders are, are very engaged 
and very supportive of advancing uh, uh, Latinos up up through the ranks. So you know we've been very transparent with our uh, with our with our numbers in terms of uh, what our what our goals and plans are uh, for Hispanic and African American uh, populations. So um, you know our what, what we tend to, what we tend to show is you know show up and speak up, right? And so we want to make sure that our leaders are there and are visible to our people and to speak up when there are, when, when, when there, when there are issues going on. Um, I have one question before we go to the closing comments and uh, it'll be very briefly from you guys. Uh, do we need legislation to be passed in order to create a better environment for the Latino community workforce after the pandemic? Or can we create that? Someone from the union, someone from the government relations from DoorDash, someone that has a strategy planned. What do we, what should we do? Is that necessary or do we do it ourselves? Ademola, briefly. Uh, uh, yeah, briefly. Uh, yes, we need legislation. Yes, we need the PRO Act. Uh, yes, the House and Senate should pass it. Uh, President Biden should sign it because it's, allowing workers you know a previous answer an answer to your previous question of how do we stop um discrimination against latinos against people of color the easiest way is have a union because the union will where you may not feel comfortable to fight for it the union will stand up for you like the union's done that repeatedly um so the best way to fix the system because it's a system that depend that affects your child care pay health care benefits all of that is create a way to take America back to when unionization was a high percent and people were actually moving to the middle class. Like all of the upward mobility for people happened when unions were at their strongest. So I feel to make sure that Latinos, people of color, and just people in, you know, lower income people in general of any race, to move them up to the next level, having a high unionization rate will be the benefit. Tony, benefit. your thoughts on it? It's the only way. I, uh, quickly, yes, I think we do need legislation. Um, I, I don't um, necessarily think aspects of the PRO Act, which is being considered at the federal level, particularly the, uh, the ABC test, which would essentially eliminate independent contractors. Um, that's not the solution in our opinion. I think legislatively, we need to find fixes that address this issue of flexibility, but also portable benefits and other benefits to workers who work across platforms and are on platforms a lot. And, um, and frankly, I do think I agree that there's a there's a role for the unions to play here. And it's it's more than likely going to be worked out at the state level. So I think we're going to see various state proposals um, and the great experiment happening, at least in, in our in our case unfold. And I think in that instance, uh, in a lot of cases, the, the you know, the unions will be a partner with us and in others um, will we'll solve it outside of the legislative arena. But I'm looking forward to that conversation. Elliot. Yeah, I, 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 if I look at the three legs of the stool, right, employers, we look at federal, local government, I think, you know, we all have an important role in, in stimulating the economy and, and just creating the right conditions for for employers to be able to create more jobs and then be able to, you know, skill those employees to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Excellent. Uh, gentlemen, time is up. So you all have a very brief time. And I know we, we, I like to speak a lot. And I can see that you all do as well. We got one minute. <laughs> Just say goodbye. Okay. Go ahead, Ademola. Your last words. My last words, you know, for for the UFCW, our members, uh, our Latino members are, are pride and joy. They are a big part of what we do. They feed all of you, but we, you know, our job is to make sure the bet that they are a respected and uh, respected part of the American society. So our hope with working with CHCI and doing panels like this is to bring up their fight to everybody. So, and also show that as an organization, we're negotiating stronger contracts for them um, that have safety requirements, increased wages, because that's what the Latino community, that's what Americans need in general. And, you know, we'll work with CHCI to make sure that this happens. I thank uh, the members of CHCI for giving UFCW the opportunity to be here and speak. I thank my fellow panelists and uh, you, Ms. Felix, for this great discussion. And I'm sure we will be discussing it further. And Tony, I'll see you probably soon. Go ahead, Tony. Great, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, thank, thank you all for um, the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, 
with you. Um, I also wanted to extend a special thanks for those students who might be participating um, as well. Um, one of your alumni from CHCI is actually currently a consultant for DoorDash, and his perspective has just been invaluable in helping us understand um, issues that are important to the Latino community and, um, and just having that background. So um, kudos for you for taking the time to, to, to learn more. Um, I would encourage folks, if you want to learn more about DoorDash's uh, commitments, um, visit doordashimpact.com. It's doordashimpact.com. In that website, we lay out a lot of what we've been trying to do um, regarding restaurant recovery, um, work with our Dasher partners, et cetera. But um, you know, throughout the pandemic, one thing we've learned is that um, you know this is a this is a um, an amazing country where we're resilient and and the restaurants, which are the backbone of, of many of our communities, are strong. So we're really looking forward to a, a strong recovery and and using the 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 pandemic is a maybe a a spur for us to really get going on this conversation around what work looks like down the road. Excellent. Elliot. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, extend thanks uh, to CHCI, uh, my fellow panelists. It was great and stimulating conversation. And you, Miss Felix, for moderating a, a great panel. So I thank you for the time. It was, it was great. And, and, and it's an honor and privilege to be part of uh, of an organization that 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 really focuses on inclusion and diversity, and uh, you know, and, and 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 can help companies enable enable their their transformations to help provide opportunities for people. So, uh, thank you. Yes, thank and you. thank you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. And now, for all of you guys that have joined us, that have sent the questions, and that have been part of this CHCI panels uh, throughout today, I want to thank you. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're listening makes a big difference. I think uh, being informed and taking action to try to survive and help one another, it's crucial. I think we can see the end of the pandemic very soon. I'm crossing our fingers as well. Um, of course, I don't want to take it for granted, but I, I think uh, there are opportunities ahead of us. And by trying to get inclusive and trying to to work and try to uh, accumulate more skills and abilities as we move forward, will continue to be that backbone for this country and the economy that we are trying to continue to be part of and collaborate and also to co create this uh, nation as a permanent nation as a home for every single immigrant Latinos and non-Latinos that live here in the country. So on behalf of CHCI, my name is Atitiki Felix, news anchor for Univision Washington and Politica Ya. I thank you for being here today, for being part of this and for being informed once again. Thank you and I'll see you soon.